hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Open Garden. Okay, so it's this time of year where we can um, we can get the uh, the ginger up. Now, as you can see, the plant um, is starting to sort of go over. You can see it's starting to get a little bit limp, and the leaves are starting to die back. So, the best thing I can do now is get the ginger out and take it into the house away from the frost. Now, if I've not watered this now for um, around a month, but I've left it growing because the uh, the tubers will you know sort of still continue to form under the ground. So. The, the, this has not been as good as it was last year, um, so I don't know quite what to expect when I dig it up, but we'll, we'll, we'll fetch it up now and see what we've got underneath the ground. And um, what I will be doing with this is making um, apple and ginger um, pie. Now, it is really nice. What you do is you get your uh, cooking apples, stew some um, cooking apples up with a little bit of ginger, and then um, put... Um, chop some more apples up and put it in right at the end and then bake that in a pastry base and uh, it is really nice. You can also add um, cinnamon as well but um, it's a nice um, sort of flavour to have at this time of year, it's like a Christmassy type flavour. So I will be doing that at, um, a little bit later today but uh, I'll just fetch the ginger up and see um, see what there is underneath. Now I only need uh, for the you know like a finger's worth for the uh, for the you know for the pie today, so I shan't be needing too much. But hopefully, I've got a little bit more than that in there. Obviously, ginger is really good for you um, for a number of reasons. It's uh, it's seen as a, a a very healthy thing to eat. Um, you know, it's good for the whole um, um, the whole manner of things really with your um, body. But, um, but yeah, let's um, let's see uh, let's see what we've got under the ground. Okay, so we'll just these are just um, grape grape vine leaves here that uh, that have dropped on there. But uh, okay, let's see what we've got now. I'm going to do this with my hand, um, which is another good reason why not to water it for a few weeks before you do this, um, so that the uh, the earth will come away. So I'll start with this big one here. Now I don't want to go in with a um, a trowel or anything like that because what I don't want to do is damage the damage the damage the ginger corn. So let's have a look what we've got here. So that's quite a nice that's quite a nice piece in there. So that's a that's a reasonable piece of ginger. And I'll just take the just take the stalk off there. So that's not a bad piece to start with. Hang on, just put the rest there. Now there are <coughs> there are recipes actually where you can use the stalks as well, but uh, I've I've personally never done that. Uh, I think that's possibly the piece that I started with. Okay, so there's not much on the end of that. Unless I've missed something. Now you will find with ginger that it will be near the top, uh, you know, there won't be um, too much under the ground. Um, now that's, that's pretty much what I put in the ground I think. So not much is formed on there. That, that basically there, you, know, if you can see that part there, that's the new part. Um, so that will be okay to use. Um, but uh, this, this part here, this, this larger piece here, that's the piece I actually put in, so that's, that's not going to be any good. But that that sort of part there that you can see above my hand, all of that will be okay to use. So it's not done too too um, too well this year, unfortunately. By the look of things, you know, the uh, I was possibly too late. So there's the there's the new piece there. That's the old piece. Um, so yeah, it's not done that well this year, as I expected, because the tops were a lot better last year um, than this. So. Yeah, so there's the new piece there, so that'll be the fresh piece. Now, fresh ginger most certainly is nothing like anything you can buy in the shops. Um, it's considerably um, nicer tasting, it's got a sweeter taste to it. 
um, it's a lot more flavoursome as well. Um, again, that's the new part there. So by the sounds of it, this this hasn't had by the look of it, sorry, this hasn't had the um, enough of a season really to um, to grow properly. Unfortunately, yeah. There's the there's the new piece there. I mean, we can still use it. Um, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. As I say, um, I'm not sure if I'll bother next year. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think from a from a crop point of view, I don't think that's brilliant to be honest with you. Last year we had a lot more than that. Um, oh my God, I have missed something. Oh, there's a piece there. There's another piece. As I say, with ginger, you don't need a lot in cooking. You know, you need a little bit, but the, it's nice in chilies and curries, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different drinks and uh, um, um, cakes and things like that that you can make with ginger. So uh, you know, that's that's no good. But yeah, that's the that's the ginger for this year. So I'll just I'll just get together the the bits and I'll show you where I can explain what we've got. Okay, so as you can see, these are the these these pieces are what went in the ground really, and we've had um, this is this is kind of what's grown this year. So really, last year I was getting pieces that had grown kind of that big, but this year only this much. Not quite sure why, but uh, it's had more than enough uh, water in that. But um, that's a that's a piece there that's grown this year. That bit there, um, and that that sort of end bit there has grown, um, and all of that's grown there. But uh, but yeah, I mean, if I bought that from a shop, you probably, you know, what's growing this year, you're probably looking at a pound, so it probably isn't worth really growing. But fresh ginger is really nice. And I'll be using that today in the, uh, the apple and ginger pie. Okay, so I just want to go through a few of the comments and questions that have come over in the past um, week or so. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Me Loves Coffee. UK Here We Grow, um, Tony and uh, Tina and Jason from um, Allotment Upcycling. Um, and this is to do with the uh, the ochre. Now I showed you in the video um, last time in November part one and all of the ochre plants has um, sort of gone over. Now we've had a bit of frost and uh, that's kind of gone over and basically what I need to do now um, is leave that for two or three weeks. So basically I need to dig that up um, at the end of November or the first week in December because um, it's at this time of year when the tubers start to grow at the bottom. Um, I have had some comments from um, Miller's Coffee that they've um, dug up um, their ochre already and they find that the tubers are really small. And I think what you need to do um, from the advice that I've had, obviously this is the first year that I've grown um, ochre, is uh, you need to leave it even though the plant started to die off. All the goodness is then going into the tubers and the tubers are starting to grow. So basically what you need to do is leave it until the first week in December so that they, um, you know, the tubers form properly in the ground before you start digging it up. And this is the same kind of scenario also with the Aloco and also the Mashua. What you need to do is even though the plant is starting to die back, all of the goodness is then going into the, uh, the tubers and the rhizomes underneath the ground. So what you need to do is wait. Don't be tempted to dig it up quite yet. Wait for a few more weeks before you dig those plants up and you'll be okay. Uh, the next um, next comment comes from um, Clausey100 about the chicken eggs, and um, do I get eggs during the winter? Now, I don't. I don't have light in my um, chicken run, um, so basically I rely on natural natural light. Now, I have had chickens that have gone all the way through the winter and um, laid eggs. Um, some of the chickens um, kind of stop during the winter and then start again in the spring. So what I've found is um, chickens like cream leg bars um, typically stop in the winter and then start again in the spring. Um, other chickens such as um, Moran's and uh, the, uh, you, you know, the, the, the standard brown chickens and the, um, uh, the Rhode Island Reds, they will lay through the winter if you can get them laying in you, you know, this particular year. Now the two um, the two red, um, uh, sort of Rhode Island reds, they haven't actually started laying yet. So um, I'm thinking they're not going to start until next year now because it is quite late and the light, the light has sort of gone really. So I I'm expecting they won't start till till next week. Now this week I've had a bit of a disaster. Um, I've had a fox go in the garden and even though um, two days ago I had the chickens running around on the lawn and they were perfectly happy. I put the chickens away at night and I, and I pulled the door to and I'm pretty sure I put the bolt across. However, I had a fox in the garden 
and uh, unfortunately all of my chickens apart from the two new Rhode Island Reds have been slaughtered basically so when I came up the garden yesterday it was feathers everywhere and, and unfortunately they'd killed all the chickens bar two so um, unfortunately I've, I've not had a good week with the chickens to be honest with you however um, uh, there's nothing really I can do about it now so what I have done is um, is um, you know sort of dispose of the chickens but I just wanted to quickly say um, off the off, off, off the back of that it is this time of year where you're likely to get foxes coming around um, I've been chatting to a friend of mine who's got a chicken farm this week and he's also had foxes round um, but so if you're in the countryside be really vigilant make sure everything's locked up and it's, it's impossible for the for the um, foxes to get in but also another point is um, it, at least in the UK it's actually illegal to bury chickens so if you do have any chickens that have been killed or whatever then you need to dispose of the chickens it, basically in the dustbin there's nothing else for it so uh, it is actually illegal to bury them in the ground so uh, the next comment comes from uh, Cookies Allotment over in Devon and uh, talking about the fruit cage and um, um, do do bees need to get through the net? It's it's quite easy. It depends what you're using your fruit cage for. Now, my fruit cages, I'm growing um, um, brassicas in there basically. So what I want to do is stop any kind of insect getting in there. Um, so I I want to stop aphids, um, m most certainly butterflies, and um, pigeons and things like that. That's what my fruit cages are used for. Um, now, if you are using a fruit cage for fruit, such as um, I don't know if you've got raspberries in there, or if you've got um, fruit trees like apples, pears, banana, um, not bananas, um, you know, other fruit trees like that. Then yes, you do need the bees to get in there. If there's a, if it's a, if you're using a fruit cage for fruit, i.e., um, the something that forms from the flower, then you need to have the flower pollinated to have the poll um, the, the, the the pollination to occur on the on the flower. Then you need insects to get in there to do that, i.e., bees. So if you're building a fruit cage for um, strawberries, raspberries, um, apples, pears, cherries, all this type of stuff, then what you need to have is a is a net where, where bees and other insects can get through to um, to pollinate the flowers. If you're using a fruit cage like I am, uh, which is more of a vegetable cage to be honest with you, uh, I'm growing brassicas in there. They don't need to be pollinated because basically you're eating the leaves and the and the stalks and the uh, and the flower buds, but you but you don't have to have them um, pollinated. So for me, I don't need any insects at all getting in there. But if you are, um, as I say, if you are building a fruit cage for for fruit, where you do need the flowers pollinated, then what you need to do is pick um, a net where you've got enough space in the net. So basically, you know, if it's um, to let bees get through, you need to have something like half an inch square or you know, sort of twelve. 12 millimeter square net so that the bees can actually get through to the flowers so basically yes if if you are growing um, raspberries and strawberries and things like that in your fruit cage then you do need to allow um, um, holes in the net that a bee or, or other insects can get through there so the pollination can occur uh, the next one comes from um, Cheshire Aquaponics and uh, talking about curly kale and how slowly it grows and yes curly kale is most certainly slow growing um, kale now normal kale is normally I don't know probably the, the Nero kale grows about kind of two foot high um, and the, and the, the, the Scottish kale and the, um, the other kale that I've grown this year that's sort of up at four or five foot curly kale basically you're looking at something that um, is kind of a foot or 18 inches high so there's you know there's not much height to it and it is slow growing but the one point that I did make, um, I did actually um, respond to this one, is with all brassicas, um, they don't like running dry at all. So if any of your brassicas have had a dry period, it will stunt the growth, um, particularly for the, uh, you know, for some varieties. Now, things like um, cauliflower, um, some of the strains are more resistant than others, but um, with with cauliflower, typically you need to keep them watered. If you ever let them go dry. Um, that will stunt the growth and they never really recover as soon as they've run dry once basically the the, the crop will suffer they'll, they'll, they'll never form the um, the full sized head and uh, the growth is really slow so what you might be finding um, with your kale is um, that you, you know it's had a stunted growth um, so you just need to make sure that they're always kept watered and it's and it's called a, a check 
So if it's run dry and the, and the crop's been checked, then basically it doesn't grow quite as well as it should do, and therefore you get a smaller crop or a smaller head or whatever. Uh, so that's possibly the, uh, the problem that you've had. Next comment comes from um, Allotment Up Cycling, Tina and Jason again, and they were talking about um, using runner bean seeds and stews and stuff like that. And uh, Tina said to um, to soak the soak the bean seeds overnight, and um, to boil them for at least ten minutes because there's toxins inside the uh, the bean. So obviously you need to do that before you put it into the uh, into the crop. So thank you for that tip, Tina uh, and Jason. The next one comes from um, Tony at uh, UK. Here we grow, and uh, this comes back to the mildew uh, comments that I had um, a couple of months ago, and I was saying how you can um, you can. There's, there's nothing really on the market now to prevent uh, mildew from growing on a lot of plants. Uh, but what you can do is um, three things, basically, I explained. The first one is make sure the plants are um, grown far enough apart so you've got ventilation through the, um, through the crops. That helps as well. Also, watering the ground as opposed to getting the leaves wet will also help. But also um, to basically keep the plant as healthy as you possibly can do. So make sure it's got all the nutrition and everything. Um, that it needs and also the water so that the plant can function correctly. If the plant can function correctly then it's less likely to be attacked by uh, mildew and have that sort of growing over the leaves. But Tony did put a, a, an additional thing on where what you can do is you can spray it with whole milk and uh, basically you have a uh, basically feed the foliage um, of the plant so basically what that means is rather than putting um, feed into the ground what you can do with some plants is feed the leaves and uh, basically what you do is you just spray the leaves with whole milk and what this will do is it will help to stop the mildew from um, attacking the leaves and spreading on the leaves sort of thing. So that's, that's one other tip. I've never tried that tip myself, uh, but uh, basically by spraying whole milk onto the leaves every couple of weeks that will um, sort of help safeguard. I don't think it's a um, fireproof method of preventing it, but it will safeguard against getting mildew on your plants. Um, next comment comes from um, Karen Watts. And she was. Um, this was. This was in response to me putting the uh, the grease tape on the on the fruit trees a couple of weeks ago, and uh, back in um, October. And, and she was saying, where can you get the tape from? It's available in most garden centres, to the best of my knowledge. Now that that um, that tape that I was using, um, I've had it for quite a few years now, more than ten years. And uh, if you, if you buy a real lot, it never really goes off, so you can just keep it in the shed and put it. You know, you know what you need is. It typically lasts two or three years on the plant, so what you will need to do is sort of take it off and replace it after a couple of three years. Um, but you can get it from most shops. Um, I, I had a quick search on um, the internet and Amazon sell it and there's also another few um, seed suppliers that sell it as well. But if you just search for fruit tree grease tape, um, you should find a number of places that will um, bring it up. But it's about five pound for the, um, for the, um, the reel. I couldn't find that actual tape that I was using. I'm not sure if that's still on the market or not, but uh, but there are various um, different types on the market that you can get hold of, and uh, it does make a big difference because it stops the because um, what the, the insects will find the stalk of the plant, and then they'll climb up and then they'll sort of go out to the fruiting buds and they'll lay their eggs in the fruiting buds or or even the uh, the flowers. So um, if you've got your uh, as I explained in the video, if you've got your um, trees like a spalier type where you've got them growing along a frame or something like that. You don't really need to worry about them climbing up the frame because the insects will be looking for the stalk of the plant as opposed to the, the actual metal framework if you like or the wooden framework. So don't worry about the framework, it's just the stalk of the plant because the insect hunts out for the stalk and then naturally knows to climb up the stalk. So if you um, if you protect the stalk you don't need to worry about anything else. They're not, they don't know to climb up the framework to get to the flowers, they just only know to you know, climb up the, the actual plant stalk itself. So as long as you protect that, you're fine. Uh, next comment comes from Me Loves Coffee and um, talking about uh, the Aloco, um and um, covering it with a polytunnel, and they've they've um, covered theirs with a polytunnel. And <clears throat> I just wanted to make the comment that um, these these plants, like Aloco and Ocker and the Mashua, these are from a different environment than the UK. Um, these are from the sort of South America um, Andean type areas where um, they have considerably less sort of cold wet weather than us um, so they're, they're used to a, a warmer environment um, that's typically um, you know sort of frost free or at least a longer growing period so what we need to do with these sorts of plants is because they're so um, 
you know, because they're so succulent, because they're so sort of sappy plants, very much like begonias. Um, they, you know, the first sign of frost, what will happen is the, the water molecules um, inside the plant will actually form into um, ice crystals. And these ice crystals form inside the plant and they cut through the plant's um, cells inside and basically damage the plant. That's why they all sort of wilt and fall over. Um, and there's nothing really you can do with that. Um, now, a polytunnel will, will sort of protect them to a degree, but really if you want to protect the plants from being damaged by frost, uh, what, you, what you will need is a heated polytunnel. And what that will do is it will stop the air from getting um, too frosty, which will stop the ice crystals forming inside the plant's stems and leaves, which will then stop it from sort of going over. Now, these plants are reasonably, uh, you know, over the past few weeks we've had a, we have had some quite cold evenings where it's got down to kind of two or three degrees. And that's not been a problem. The Aloco has carried on growing. It's only when it drops below zero when these ice crystals form where it's really shown a, a, a massive difference, as I showed you in the video last time. So all you need to do is stop it from freezing. You haven't got to, you know, you haven't got to keep it up at 20 degrees or wherever. All you've got to do is stop it from going through that freezing point of water, which is where the damage is caused. So as long as you keep it at sort of three, four, five degrees, you know, everything should be okay and it'll carry on growing. So with your polytunnel, um, if you've got it inside a polytunnel, what you need to do is if the polytunnel isn't kept warm, uh, you will still get the same effect as if it is outside basically. Now what you can do to, um, what you can do from, to stop it from um, going cold is th there's, there's quite a few tricks you can use, many of which the Victorians used. And it's a trick that I use in the greenhouse as well. And when I was reading your comment, it really made me think about this. You haven't got to put heated, uh, you know, you haven't got electric heating in there or gas or anything like that. What, all, all you actually need is enough heat in there to stop it from freezing. Now, if you pile um, grass cuttings in there, uh, the grass cuttings, as they break down, the bacteria generate heat. And that should be more than enough heat to stop it from freezing, as long as it doesn't go too cold outside. So, what you can do is, or, or a suggestion if you have got a polytunnel with these types of crops in, if you pile um, grass cuttings in there, the grass cuttings will give off heat and that heat should be enough to uh, to prevent it from going cold. So it might be worthwhile you trying again with your Aloco, but this time of year in your polytunnel, try mulching them with grass um, or at least the path that you've got in there or somewhere inside the somewhere inside your polytunnel, pile up some grass and that will give off heat and that heat will stop the the air from freezing and therefore stop these ice crystals from forming inside the plant which will then damage the plant. So it's just worthwhile um, you know next year when you're trying it this time of year when you're cutting your grass um, put the grass cuttings in there and the and the damp grass cuttings what they'll do is they'll start to break down and the bacteria will generate heat which should keep your aloco hot enough to stop it from freezing. Uh, the last comment comes from um, Andrew Lee and he was talking about the financial, now I think he's been looking at an older video where I've talked about the financial side of the um, the allotment and he was saying that he's looked at his allotment and uh, he's never really made money. Now the things that the things that you need to look at with an allotment is is there's only there's only point in growing stuff that you're going to eat obviously because if you know if you if you're not going to eat what you grow then there's not really much point growing it um, but um, things like strawberries, raspberries, potatoes, um, are, and, and also runner beans are most certainly cash crops. So if you bought if you bought the runner beans that I've grown this year, now I've grown somewhere in the region of 60 kilos of runner beans this year. Um, if you were to buy those in a supermarket, you would be looking at over 100 pounds to buy those from a supermarket. Um, if you are, um, you know, if you look at the the strawberries, if you think a pint of strawberries is like two pounds in the supermarket. Uh, the amount of punnets that I've had out of the, um, the you, know, you know, that just that patch of ground to the to, to the left of me or to the right as you're looking at me, um, I've had probably um, 30 or 40 punnets of strawberries, and this year wasn't a particularly good, good, good year. If you multiply 20 or 30 by two, which is two pound per punnet, that's how much money you've made on the strawberries. So if you, you know, you know, if you look at it, you know, from that kind of point of view, but it's only worthwhile you growing what you're actually going to eat. Um, potatoes aren't are, aren't exactly an expensive thing to buy, you know. I mean, you can, you know, most certainly around here you're paying um, sort of six, seven pound for a sack of potatoes, uh, which is a 25 kilo sack. If you look at it from that point of view, I probably grow 
um, some in the region of nine or ten sacks full of potatoes a year. So really, that's only kind of sixty pounds worth. But if you look at um, if you look at the the cost of potatoes in the supermarket, which is where I get my prices from, I always typically look at three three of the main supermarkets like Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, for example, or Morrison's or wherever, and I compare the prices and take the cheapest one or the average, and then multiply that up by the weight that I've got. Now, if I was to buy potatoes, I wouldn't typically buy a sack of them. I'd go to a supermarket and buy a, a five kilo or two and a half kilo bag of potatoes. Um, so I do it from that because I'm kind of looking at it from my perspective how I would buy these vegetables if I wasn't growing them in the garden. Also, as well, um, you need to realise the quality of the, uh, the the vegetables that you're growing in your allotment, and you know you will pay top money for that quality of vegetable if you bought it in the shop. Because uh, you are, if you like me, you grow in organically and also you can't get fresher from your own garden. And um, so if you were to buy that in a shop, you would be paying a bit more anyway. So you need to kind of weigh up um, how, th how things would, how much things would cost if you bought them to the quality of, you know, you know what you're growing. Now, things like the, uh, the kale um, and also spinach. I mean, if you think a small bag of spinach, which is probably 500 grams, uh, will cost you a couple of pounds in a supermarket. Um, you know, you know, when you think how much spinach you've harvested off the garden, you know, you can, you can, it soon adds up. And so, what I always do is, I always think, well, if I'd have bought this from a shop, how much would I have paid for it? Um, and so, if you if you if you look at the financial side of things, I typically spend somewhere in the region of three to four hundred pounds a year buying things and improving things and paying for the, um, the ground rental on the allotment and uh, other things. So it's typically around three or four hundred pounds I spend. And I actually make somewhere in the region of kind of 1,600 pounds just just through the the, the sheer volume of um, you know crops that I get off. So, but I will be going through the financial side of it in in a bit more detail um, in in a few weeks' time when I've got to the end of the season. But um, if you look at um, things like onions are another crop. Um, now, if you buy um, if you buy a big sack of onions, you can buy a big sack of onions for about six or seven pound from you know from near me. But if you went to a supermarket, you would be spending a lot more than that. Um, so onions aren't particularly a cash crop to monitor. The potatoes are good because they're so easy to grow, but things like fruit, raspberries, strawberries, and things like that—that's where the money is. And most certainly tomatoes as well. The amount of tomatoes that I've grown in this greenhouse this year, if you price those up at a supermarket. You know, it's quite a lot of money, and also cucumbers are kind of anywhere between 50, 50 pence and a pound each. And I've had forty odd cucumbers out of this greenhouse this year, so there's forty pence straight away. So, just the cucumber. If, if you look at it this way, just the cucumbers I've grown in this greenhouse, effectively pay for the uh, for the for the ground rental on the the allotment. So, it's. I think if you look at it, you know, if you look at the whole picture, I think it's difficult not to at least cover your costs. Uh, with an allotment, most certainly if you've got a full size allotment and you're fully utilising the ground. Um, another another cash crop is the rhubarb. If 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 you buy rhubarb in a shop, it's it's most certainly expensive. And if you grow the volume of rhubarb that I'm growing, it, it's a no-brainer. You know the any ground that you grow rhubarb on will you, you know the yield off there will most certainly make you money. So uh, if you look at it that way, I I I don't I don't. Um, do the allotment to save money or make money or anything like that. I, I do it for the love of growing things and I like to have fresh vegetables um, which are healthy and I know there's no chemicals been on them. That's the reason why I do it but uh, it's it's difficult to... I find it difficult anybody grow, having an allotment who would actually lose money doing it. If anything I think you make money or you, you save money which is probably a better way to do it. Anyway that's all the comments for this week and um, I'll collect the comments for next time and um, carry on um, in a few weeks time. So, I hope this episode has been some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Up My Garden.